So good afternoon, uh, evening or morning, depending on the part of the world that you are joining us uh, today. Uh, my name is Germán Fernández. I'm the CEO and president of ISAN, the International School of uh, Agri-Management uh, based in, in Almería, Spain. Today, we continue with uh, our webinar series. Um, the topic uh, today is going to be uh, the rise uh, of the halal food market. Um, excuse me, I think like uh, everybody, um, if you could mute yourselves, because I think there's some people that are not muted, so I can hear the, the background, so sorry. Um, so uh, I was saying that today uh, we continue the webinar series where we bring uh, top speakers and the hottest topics uh, in the agribusiness world. Here we've been touching, you know, like new trends in the agricultural sector, like insects for food and feed, cellular agriculture, um, many, many different uh, new markets uh, in the agribusiness sector. And today we are talking about the rise uh, of the halal food market, where we will be talking about the key trends and business opportunities for this subsector within the, the agribusiness uh, spectrum. So today our speaker, uh, and thanks for joining, Tomas, uh, is Tomas Guerrero Blanco. So uh, Mr. Guerrero was born in Spain, um, but he's always been very uh, passionate about the Islamic economy and the emerging markets uh, in general. Um, he has dedicated himself uh, to the halal industry and the sovereign wealth funds. Uh, he began his career working as a researcher at the SADE Business School, Economic Intelli Intelligence Unit. It's called SADE Geo for Mr. Javier Solana, who is the former NATO Secretary General, and Mr. Javier Santiso, former OECD uh, Development Center Director and Chief Economist. During his years at the SADE Geo, he organized events on entrepreneurship and emerging markets such as Start, Startup Spain, which is like a really you know, big uh, event now uh, in Spain, uh, or the Glo Globalization Labs. And he also contributed to the development uh, of the first four editions of the KPNG ISEX Sovereign Wealth Funds Report. Uh, right now, uh, he's based uh, in Dubai. Uh, and for the past uh, few years, uh, he's been the director of the Halar Trade and Marketing Center. So before I, uh, I pass on to, to, to Tomas, let me give you a little bit of uh, logistics uh, about how we're gonna be working. So Tomas will be making the presentation. We normally have questions from the audience uh, at the end, but if there is something uh, that you feel that it will be relevant to make the, the question uh, whilst he's making the presentation, just type it. I'm gonna be checking you know, uh, the chat and then I will, you know, if I think it's convenient, you know, I will ask Tomas, you know, to just take a pause and take it from there. All right. So uh, thank you very much, Tomas, uh, for joining us. Uh, we're really looking forward, you know, to hearing from you. Uh, I mean, I've lived in Dubai as well. I love Middle East, uh, you know, in general. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you, Herman, for your introduction. Good uh, morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Tomás Guerrero. As uh, Herman said, I'm the manager of the Halal Trade and Marketing Center. It's a global business development center focused on the halal economy opportunities for the industry, which includes producers, uh, manufacturers, importers, distributors, and retailers of halal products and services. So here, basically, we are supporting companies across the world. We are supporting organizations to expand their business operations in the 57 Muslim majority countries where the halal certification is mandatory compulsory for marketing different types of consumer goods such as food, uh, pharma or cosmetics uh, products. First of all, I would like to express uh, my deep gratitude to Islam for inviting me to be here today with all of you to speak about the rise of the halal market. So basically today I will be delivering a short presentation I will try to use around 20-25 uh, minutes for introducing the, the topic. So I will be here mm. talking about the, the halal market. So let me share with all of you the, the, the presentation so we can 
start. Oh yeah, I was gonna I was gonna tell you. Yeah, no problem. The, the, <laughs> the session. So after this uh, short uh, uh, introduction, I will uh, share with all of you the the presentation. As you can see, uh, the name of the topic today is the rise of the halal food market, key trends and business opportunities. Well, first of all, we have to start defining what halal means. So halal, as probably some of you already know, is an Arabic term meaning lawful as per the Islamic law. Well, the halal economy is composed of uh, sectors, economic sector, whose uh, core products and services are uh, affected by the Islamic law, such as food, that, that must be uh, halal, finance, that, that must be uh, salary compliance, or uh, fashion, that must be uh, modest, okay? So this is the, 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 the halal concept, and it's important to have this idea in mind when we want to talk about uh, the halal market. Basically, halal is uh, defining what uh, Muslims can do, can eat, can buy. So for that reason, we are talking about the halal market, okay? When we talk about the halal market, we are talking about the Muslim population. We are talking about 1.8 billion people across the world. We are talking about the 25% of the total population. So as I said, halal defines what Muslims can do, can buy, can eat, okay? From the uh, f &B point of view. Having said that, it's also uh, relevant to highlight that the halal market itself is a regulated one. Well, when we look at the halal market from the regulation point of view, we have three different uh, bodies or organizations regulating this uh, fast growing business niche. First of all, in the Muslim majority countries, we have the halal standardization bodies. They are the ones in charge of setting the rules, setting the requirements. They are the ones coming with the halal standards. They are the ones defining the rules for this market in their home countries. Then also in the Muslim majority countries, we also have the halal accreditation bodies. Those organizations are the ones in charge of auditing the halal certification bodies in order to check if the halal certification bodies have or not the right skills, the religious and technical ones, to certify companies according to their halal standards in their home countries. And finally, we have the certifiers itself, the halal certification bodies, okay? And they are the ones auditing the companies. They are the ones going to audit the facilities to check if the companies are able or not to produce goods or deliver services according to the halal standards. Well, this is a huge market, but from the regulation point of view, we have some problems, challenges, issues. First of all, we don't have a global halal standard. We don't have an ISO. We have different rules for regulating the same market. So this uh, fragmentation is uh, generating complexity. So for example, here at the Halal Trade and Marketing Center, we are supporting companies providing the guidelines to navigate this complexity. We are supporting companies to understand what are the requirements, which requirements are they are there. We, we are helping them to understand the requirement that they need to fulfill to comply with the halal standards, then get the halal certification and finally produce and export their products according to the existing halal standards. For example, here we have the halal legal framework for the UAE, okay? For the United Arab Emirates. As you can see, we have 
different bodies regulating this market. First of all, we have the halal standardization bodies. We have here at the UAE for the standardization ESMA, but ESMA standards are not the only ones applicable in the UAE or at the UAE. We also have more standards, for example, the GCO ones, the ones coming from the GCC halal standardization body. Obviously, those halal standards or requirements coming from the regional point of view, from the GCC uh, point of view, they are not the, they are the second best. Okay, after the ESMA ones, after the national ones, we have also the regional ones. And finally, from the global point of view, or from the international point of view, we also have standards, have standards, SMIC ones, the ones coming from the OIC, Halal Standardization Body, SMIC. It's the, 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 the Halal uh, Standardization Body for the 57 Muslim majority countries. And obviously, UAE is part of GCC as well as it's part of, of, of uh, OIC. And for that reason, we have also to accept the halal uh, standards uh, coming from uh, these um, organizations, GCO and SMIC. But imagine for companies trying to produce and export their products to the uh, UAE, sometimes they don't know which are the rules to follow that they have to follow. Obviously the national ones are the most important ones, but we are also accepting other rules, other standards from the halal point of view. And that is sometimes generating a, a doubt that you're generating problems. So it's a big market as we will see uh, later on, but it's not an easy one. Why? Because the regulation is becoming so complex. This is the framework for UAE. We have more or less the same in all the Muslim majority countries. And we have 57 across the world. Okay, so imagine coming back to the UAE legal framework, we have different uh, halal standardization bodies or different halal standards applicable here at the UAE. Then from the accreditation point of view, we have, for example, here, uh, at the UAE, we have uh, two halal accreditation bodies, one here in Dubai, AYAC, the Emirates International Accreditation Center, and another one in Abu Dhabi, NAS, Emirates National Accreditation System. And, and also from the regional point of view, from the GCC uh, point of view, we have also another halal accreditation body. We have the GCC Accreditation Center, GAC. And finally, we have also uh, many certifiers and as you can see, we also have a national halal brand. And behind this, we have many requirements. And when you compare the requirement, when you compare the halal standards, when you compare the rules, sometimes there are small differences. And that's the problem. Here, for example, if we compare, I will give you a, a short or quick example in order to allow you to better understand what I'm trying to say. For example, thinking about the meat industry, if you want to produce halal meat in order to be able to export that meat to the GCC countries, as well as to the Southeast Asian countries, to the Muslim majority countries there, such as Indonesia or Malaysia. For example, here we are not allowing, according to our halal standards, we are not allowing standing before the slaughtering process. Okay, so our rules are um, fighting or are uh, not matching with the animal welfare laws in Europe or in the Western countries. But for companies there, they have to follow our rules if they want to introduce, if they want to sell, if they want to market, for example, halal meat here in the GCC countries. But if they want to do the same in the Southeast Asia, in the Muslim majority countries there, such as Indonesia, Malaysia, they can use a standing system if they use a specific standing system and 13 parameters to uh, standing the animals 
before the slaughtering process. So thinking about this, we can say, okay, it's a huge and great opportunity and we will see now why, but from the regulation point of view, it's not an easy going back, okay? Here, imagine only for the UAE, we have different halal standards, different uh, organizations stand, uh, providing the standards, providing the accreditations, different certifiers. So for a small country such as UAE, 9 million population, we have this complex uh, halal legal frame. Imagine when you want to come with a global solution or when you want to export not only to the UAE, you, you want to be uh, able to, to export to all the Muslim majority countries, to the 57 the Muslim one. Obviously, you have to adapt your business according not only to the UAE standards or GCC one for the GCC countries. Also, you have to play or adapt your business, your facilities, your production system according to other standards. So that's the problem when we talk about halal from the regulation side. But uh, moving on, now I would like also to talk before going to see the market itself, the opportunities, I would like also to use some minutes to share with all of you the drivers behind the success or the growth of the halal market. When we talk about the halal market, we are talking about a huge population. We are talking about the Muslim population. We are talking about 1.8 billion people. As you can see here, we have a large, young and fast growing population. Currently, as I said, we have 1.8 billion people, Muslims. But according to the latest uh, projections, estimations, forecast in the year 2030, this uh, demographic segment will be reaching 2.2 billion people. And they will be representing around the 30% of the total population. That's something incredible. And obviously, if you want to target these uh, consumers, you have to get the halal certification. You have to go through halal. Why? Because halal is mandatory for marketing consumer goods in the Muslim majority countries. If not, you can't export, you can't market your products. So imagine if you want to target the 30% of the total population, the 57 Muslim majority countries, also those countries with a significant Muslim population, they are not the Muslim majority countries, but they have significant Muslim populations such as India with 120 million Muslim people or US with 20 or the uh, European uh, Union where we have uh, around 50 million Muslim people consumers, you have to get the halal certification. You have to go through the uh, halal uh, process. Then another reason to explain the success and the growth behind the halal market, it's the economic growth in the Muslim majority countries. This is another reason. This is another driver or factor to explain the growth of the halal market. When we talk about halal, we said we are talking about 57 Muslim majority countries. We are talking mostly about emerging markets. We are talking about countries in North Africa, Middle East, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, Sahel as well in Africa. So we are talking about emerging countries. Um, before the pandemic, they were the ones leading the economic growth worldwide. They are dynamic countries from the economic point of view. So this is another factor boosting the halal market worldwide. The Muslim majority countries are emerging ones and they are growing a lot. They are leading the growth 
the economic growth in the world. Here you have the data, so you can see how those music majority countries were growing above the average of the uh, world economy before the pandemic. And according and again to the IMF World Bank forecast, after COVID, now they will be again the ones growing more. So this is another strong factor supporting the growth of the halal markets. And finally, the third driver is related to this last one. Obviously, the economic growth in the Muslim majority countries is empowering the Muslim population. So in those countries, we can find now emerging Muslim middle places, and they are demanding more and more halal products and services. So this is another reason to think about halal as a huge opportunity. We have the demographic building, we have the economic growth, and we have the middle places. And here you can see how the middle places will be, will be distributed across the world in the next decades. If you can see the 60% of the total middle places will be in the Asia region, where most of the 1.8 billion Muslim people live. So this is, again, a factor, a strong one, to support this industry, this sector, this market, the other one. So now we will see, before going directly to the F and B market, we will see an overview about the halal market itself. Why? Because when we talk about halal, we are not talking only about food. We are talking also about other sectors. And here you have the halal market overview. Obviously, the F and B sector is one of the largest, is one of the biggest, is the one probably offering today more opportunities to those companies thinking about going abroad to sell or export their products. But it's also good to know that we have business opportunities beyond the F&B sector. And by the way, many of these opportunities, the ones, for example, related to cosmetics or halal uh, tourism, Muslim friendly tourism, they are also connected to the F and B uh, sector. Why? Because, for example, for producing halal cosmetics, we need halal raw material. And halal cosmetics is basically natural cosmetics. And for providing, uh, sorry, for producing a halal uh, cosmetics, natural ones, we need raw material coming sometimes from the food industry. And for halal tourism or Muslim friendly tourism, the same. For hotels, for hospitality, for restaurants, we need halal food. So the halal FMB sector is also, a, let's say, a tool for boosting other halal sectors, such as the cosmetics or the tourism one. And now, please try to keep the numbers in your mind because we will see the next slide is uh, almost the same, but we will see the forecast for the year 2025. Here we can see the numbers for 2021. The FMB uh, sector, the halal one, is uh, close to 1.2 trillion dollars, okay? But if we go to see the forecast for year 2025, here we can see that, for example, going to our sector, to the FMB one, 
we can see that this uh, niche will be moving from the 1.2 trillion dollars to 1.6 trillion dollars. So it will be uh, growing. But uh, if you check uh, the numbers for the remaining uh, halal sector, you will be uh, finding the same. All the sectors will be growing. They will continue growing. Why? Because they have, as we saw, those drivers boosting, supporting the growth, the expansion of this uh, halal, uh, this, this uh, market, this uh, business niche. And now, going directly to the topic, we will see uh, some uh, ideas, we will see data and some uh, opportunities as well as trends about the halal uh, F&B uh, sector. Well, again, an overview, we already saw the number according to the uh, estimations in the year 2021, the Muslim population spent $1.2 trillion dollars on F&B products, okay? In order to have the perspective, that amount of money represent approximately the 12% of the total F&B uh, consumed uh, that year on 2021. And another interesting thing, when we see uh, the numbers, um, many people, they don't know this, and it's funny sometimes to discover, uh, when you compare the expenditure of the Muslim population on halal FMB uh, products, and you compare that with the expenditure made by the nationals coming from countries such as China, USA, Japan or India, we find, we discovered that the global Muslim market is the second largest one from the uh, f and uh, point of view. And here maybe some of you are thinking about, okay, Thomas, wonderful, but Muslims spend $1.2 trillion and that amount went to buy halal certified FMB products. Well, according to the estimations, the Muslims across the world in the year 2021 uh, spent $1 trillion, okay, uh, on halal certified FMB products. So the number is $1.2 trillion on FMB products and $1 trillion on halal certified FMB products, almost the full uh, number, okay, or amount. So once we have this idea in mind that we are talking about the second largest FMB market in the world, we have here another reason to believe in the power of the halal FMB market. We saw we already saw strong arguments to believe in this market. We saw the power of the halal market when we were reviewing the factors of drivers behind, no? 1.8 billion people, 57 Muslim minority countries, emerging uh, Muslim middle places. That's more than enough. We're talking about 1.2 trillion dollars market itself. It it's more than enough, but this market is offering the opportunities in the sense of giving also us, giving, giving us um, the opportunity to work with the food dependency of the food security. Let me explain to you what I want to say. When we look at the when we look at the muslim majority countries especially those in north africa sahel and middle east 
we discover or we find net importers in terms of F&B products. For example, here in the GCC uh, region, or in the GCC countries, we are importing around the 75% of the food that we are consuming, okay? We have oil, we have gas, but we don't have food. And we don't have here, let's say the conditions, okay, for producing food. It's not cost effective or directly it's not possible. Why? Because we don't have water, it's too hot and so on. So we have to go to the market. We have to import the F&B products. So we have the OIC dependency. OIC is the organization of the 57 Muslim majority countries. It's a multilateral organization, okay? So we talk about the OIC food dependency. We are importing almost the 70 or 80% of the food that we are consuming. So this is another factor. This is another key opportunity. Why not to think about those countries, those powerhouses in terms of producing F&B products? The matching, it's clear. We have oil, we have gas, and because of that, we have resources, we have money, but we don't have food. Why not to think about Latin America? Why not to think about Africa or some countries in Europe, such as Spain or Italy, for example, to try to help the Muslim majority countries here in the Middle East or in the North Africa to uh, get the, 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 the supply. Obviously, for that, the producers in our Western or in our countries, they have to get the halal certification if they want to capitalize on these opportunities. But the opportunity is there. And we have to import. So imagine countries in Latin America or Africa, they have here a huge opportunity to export, to sell food products, there's only ones in, for example, in the Middle East. Qatar is importing the 90% of the food that they are consuming. We are importing here at the UAE around the 75%, but in average is around 70, 75% of the total food consumption. So this is another reason, this is another factor when we talk about F and B. We don't have the same opportunity when we talk about other consumer goods, but when we come into the F and B industry, we also have this behind the halal market, okay? And here, for example, again, coming back to the meat industry, we have a good uh, example. Here, uh, we have a slide where we can see, for example, the GCC main meat importers. As you can see here, we're importing around the 90% of the uh, lamb and beef meat, okay? And as you can see, there are uh, countries mobilizing uh, resources, important amounts of money to import meat, halal meat, okay? Here you have Saudi Arabia, UAE, Dubai, so the GCC countries. They are every single year spending a lot of money on halal meat. And as I said, for example, we are importing in the GCC the 90% of the beef and lamb meat. And then the funny thing is, who are the main meat exporters? To the GCC, who are the ones producing halal meat and then exporting that halal meat to, to the GCC? And here you have the exporters, the ranking. And the largest provider of halal meat to the GCC country is Brazil. Then we have Australia, then we have uh, India, Pakistan, Ukraine, US. And the thing is, 
we don't have, uh, okay, we have Pakistan, but the largest producers are not Muslim majority countries. And here, why not to have, you know, more countries from Europe, from Africa, or from Latin America, for example. Okay, so here you have this uh, opportunity, as I was explaining the OIC dependency uh, uh, one. Here you have a, a real case, for example, with the meat. The same happened with dairy products, uh, raw materials. Uh, I said the 85, the 80, the 75 percent of the food that we are consuming, we are bringing them from from abroad, okay? So here, a clear example with the meat again, to see the opportunity. Imagine Brazilians or Australians or, uh, you know, Ukrainian maybe no longer there because of the sad situation there, or, you know, companies in the US, they are capitalizing on the, the opportunities, but they are not uh, Muslim majority countries, but the companies there, they got the idea. They got the halal certification, they know that they have to go through the halal legal framework, that complex one, to be able to be ready to market their uh, F&B products here. But the, 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 the business is, is, is huge. We saw the population, it's growing. We saw the, 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 the economy, the Muslim majority countries, the economies are, are growing. The, 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 the opportunity is, is massive. So, here are a real case or examples to understand the, the to size the, the opportunity. And finally, I would like to uh, finalize this uh, presentation with a slide sharing uh, some uh, success cases or uh, sharing information about some of the key industry players in the halal market. No? So, for example, if you go to Europe or if you go to US uh, and you uh, go to retailers such as Carrefour or Tesco, you already have sections for halal uh, specific ones for halal uh, uh, F&B uh, products. Uh, for example, also thinking about the, the, the logistics and transport, transportation, uh, there are uh, also uh, halal certified uh, seaports. Why? Because they want to uh, guarantee the, the, the full traceability of the uh, halal uh, family products. They want to uh, avoid cross-contaminations. So they are also getting the halal certification and offering or providing uh, halal certified uh, logistics uh, and uh, transport uh, services. Then going, for example, to the producers or manufacturers, for example, Nextle, they already have more than 150 halal certified factories across the world. So it's a huge uh, market, it's a huge uh, opportunity. And I hope that this uh, presentation make you, uh, uh, make you be uh, also uh, passionate uh, about this uh, uh, opportunity, make you uh, understand the, the size of this uh, market, uh, maybe, in the future, uh, you can also uh, work uh, with the halal industry and you can also enjoy, as I'm enjoying here with this uh, fast growing uh, business niche. So thank you so much. I will be here for, for your questions. I mean, thanks uh, very much, Tomas, uh, for a very, very insightful uh, presentation. I think it really gave uh, an overview of uh, the potential I mean, the, the, the current opportunity and the potential of the halal uh, market, you know, as, as the, you know, the Muslim population is growing and also the, the acceptance uh, of the certification is getting more and more in, in all the different stakeholders. Uh, so, you know, thanks for that. Uh, I think it has opened many, you know, many, many, uh, the eyes to many, uh, many questions have been answered uh, if some of them, you know, were thinking, okay, how should I go about this? So all good. So I start with the questions. We are starting to get a few ones. So the first one is coming from Javier Ruiz. Um, and he's asking if the Halal certification is open to non-Muslim uh, companies. No, 
No, the certifiers must be owned by Muslims. And going to his uh, second question, because I already saw the chat. Yeah. Yeah, the auditors must be also Muslims. So it's like kosher for Jewish. Halal uh, yeah. is uh, regulated by Muslims. So thinking about, for example, Guloveritas or ESC, the big uh, certifiers or Global Gap, for example, you know, providing other uh, certifications of the f and industry is not uh, the same. Here we have a different uh, game, different legal framework, as you saw, complex one, and thinking or talking about the ownership or the or about who must be behind the uh, halal certifiers as well as behind the uh, audit process. Yeah, they must be uh, Muslims according to the halal standards. Okay. And um, yeah, I think you answered already the auditors part. Yeah, that they don't yeah. have to be Muslim. Um, then the next one is for Cesar Rodriguez from the Dominican Republic. Actually, an alumni, an alumni from Islam. Uh, so uh, he's asking uh, how can he get the requirement for halal certification in that country? What would be the procedure to do it in, if you know? Yes, um, by the way, I was there a few years ago. I was uh, dealing with the Dominican Republic government. At that time, Pro Dominicana was CEIRD. That was the name of the trade promotion agency. Uh, Mr. Marius uh, Leon was the CEO, and I was there trying to explain them how to uh, organize or how to uh, develop a halal ecosystem there uh, in the Dominican Republic. So basically, companies there, they must find or they must connect with the halal certification body, recognize with the accreditations from the Muslim majority countries. Why? Because, okay, there are more than 400 halal certification bodies across the world, but only some of them are recognized by the halal accreditation bodies in the Muslim majority countries. So you have to get the certification from one of them if you want to export. Why? Because if you get the certification from a random certifier, you will be maybe able to export to US or to Europe, to the Muslim communities there. Why? Because they are not Muslim majority countries. So the borders, they are not, you know, the officials at the borders, they are not uh, requesting the halal certification coming from a, a specific certifier okay. recognized by the halal authorities. So in Dominican Republic, obviously, no Muslim majority countries, companies there, the F&B one, they must get uh, the certification from a certifier there or in the region with those accreditation. So that's all. This uh, not, uh, you know, uh, nothing beyond that. You have to get the certification from a recognized and a certification board. Um, do you know where, uh, if there is any place where uh, those companies can be identified in those countries, the halal certification companies in those countries? Yeah. Yes, uh, for example, in Latin America, you have with all the accreditation, because here, and this is, sorry, something yeah. important to highlight. As I said, not all the certifiers have those accreditations. So imagine you can get today the certification from a certifier with the accreditations only from the UAE. Okay, you are able to export your f and product to the UAE. But what happens if tomorrow you find another opportunity in Saudi Arabia or Malaysia and your certifier is not recognized by their halal uh, accreditation uh, authority, by, halal, by their halal accreditation body, by their halal uh, authorities, you are not able to export them to those other countries. So the most important thing here is try to get a global solution since the beginning. Get the certification from a certifier with all the presentation. So in Latin America, we have a problem. We don't have uh, too many and only three, one in Brazil, another one in the US, another one in Mexico. They are the only ones with all the accreditations and the ones certifying uh, companies, F&B ones uh, there. 
uh, so you know allowing ex companies to, to to export their products to the 57 majority countries so if they send me an email i will send the, the contact details of those uh, certifiers in, in, in latin america in europe you have more obviously but in the americas itself for example thinking about the Dominican republic or thinking about uh, you know you don't have uh, too many options in europe you have more so they you know depending on your location you have some more or less uh, options available but uh, thinking always about the ones with all the accreditations okay great uh, i'm gonna share uh, your email address uh, in the in the chat uh, if, in case they need it if it's okay with you yeah for sure please please go ahead more than okay. happy to support the guys no okay uh, and then the other question is from musa uh, she's uh, from south africa and she's doing our full-time program in almeria so she's asking uh, about sustainable development goals uh, is the most popular part in terms of farm to fork uh then how different is that to the halal process you know like just to get like similarities uh from there good question because it's matching basically okay. halal is also from farm to farm and we are talking about the traceability system to avoid cross contaminations to uh, warranty that companies are using only halal uh, raw materials they are producing their goods, their food products with uh, halal raw materials, and then with the traceability system avoiding the, the, the cross contamination. So we are also talking about uh, traceability uh, from farm to fork. It's more or less it's matching with the uh, ACG's uh, goals. Okay, great. And then it's similar. Your this, your certification is similar to ISO. 22,000 or HACCP, you know, those type of certifications or equivalent? No, no. it's not the same. Uh, first of all, we don't have a, a ISO. We, we, we hope uh, we can get uh, one or we can come with a, a global other standard because uh, it will be great for the industry. But uh, today, as I said, we have different standards for regulating the, the market. So we have uh, national standards, regional, global ones, uh, different national standards. So it's not easy. So it's not the, the, the same. And by the way, here we have also the religious point of view. It's not only about uh, technical uh, requirements, also about the religious one. So it's similar to kosher, mm -hmm. kosher, or Jewish. It's uh, matching in many cases with the halal uh, certification. They are, let's say, uh, they are coming with similar requirements or similar uh, processes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's check if we have any other more questions. Uh... Um, there was another comment saying that this is good for the Muslim population in other countries, you know, to see that it's growing more, you know, and they have access to halal products. Um, again, Musa is asking, what's the difference between kosher, halal, and organic? I prefer to send an email because I don't want to, you know, it's, it, 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 there are, uh, you know, it's because we are comparing different things. Okay, we have organic. And then we have halal and kosher. So, yeah, you can find uh, similar requirements or similar uh, things, but we also have some uh, important or relevant uh, differences. So, better if you can uh, send me an email and then I will okay. send with you a detail or, you know, uh, uh, response. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, I think uh, we actually have like, uh, you know, reached the end. Uh, thanks very much, you know, Tomas, uh, you know, for for really, really interesting topic and um, great potential. You know, I think one of the things that are really important is to diversify, like from some point of view is to realize that there are many different subsectors within agribusiness, you know, 
And certainly the, the halal is one that is really growing and with a huge uh, potential. I really hope that uh, this has helped all the all the audience, you know, and thanks uh, again, you know, for, for your time. Most welcome, uh, happy to, to be here today uh, with all of you. If you have doubts, if you have uh, questions, you have now my email feel free and working for the Dubai government. So I'm here to assist you. And I hope we can continue the, the conversation. Thank you very much, Thomas. So now for the ones that are interested, uh, because I also seen some of our alumni and current students, you know, uh, I'm just gonna make a very brief uh, presentation about the, pro the two programs that we have in English, our full-time program and our online program just to give you the information and whoever is interested, you know, then, uh, you know, they will be able to, to contact somebody from my team. You know, I will leave, I'm gonna leave the email address of Gemma, one second, and then I will start, well, I, I will do it when I, once I finish. So you can see the slide. So we do have two uh, separate programs uh, where we try to give you a 360 overview of the whole sector. Um, one of them is online, the other one is face-to-face. -face. The one is face-to-face, -face, we have around 40 visits to companies. We go with our students to the international trade fairs, uh, like a Smart Agri Summit through the Traction, through the Logistica, and next year is going to be Info Agro uh, in, Al in Almeria. And then the students, they also have a consulting project with a real company, and they do an internship. Then the online one is the same content, but the difference is obviously that is uh, online. Um, the different modules, they have uh, tutors, and they work in teams with the students coming from many different uh, countries. We already have our first class from the MIAM online, where we have a lot of students from Africa, Middle East, um, and India. And um, the, way, the way it works is that you also do a final project which uh, based on our experience from the ones that they have done the online one in Spanish, where we already have done six editions, they either want to create a company uh, in the agribusiness sector, or they want to diversify their company, or they are gonna be talking, they have an idea of a business, right? So it's a very, very practical program. And the students that are doing the online program, they will have the opportunity to come to Almeria for a week, uh, for the Almeria experience trip, where in one week they have an overview of the whole agricultural sector in Almeria, they have networking with companies, and also it's an opportunity for them, you know, to understand the technologies and how they can apply it back home, okay? So the program in Almeria starts uh, mid-September. Uh, we already have uh, a lot of applications. We actually uh, were we were going we were going to close uh, the class, but we are thinking about having extra seats, uh, and it's looking extremely diverse. We have students from Russia, uh, Lebanon, <coughs> um, Egypt, Africa, India, yeah. Mexico, like everywhere. Okay, uh, and um, it starts uh, mid September, and the program obviously is in English. Okay, uh, and then for the Mian Online, as I told you, we just started our first class uh, that was live online. We still, if somebody really wanted to start now, still the next, if, if it's within June, they could still join uh, the, 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 the class that just started, but our next intake will be in October, November. So I'm gonna write down uh, here, uh, the the email the email address of uh, our advisor Gemma Serrano. One second. That you have all the details. Yeah. So I don't know if I put it for everybody or uh, everyone in the meeting. Sorry. So here we have. And then if you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer them uh, as well. Um, I think there is one question from Gianni. Uh, so she's saying, will you propose the Almeria experience next year? Yes. So we actually are going to have one in October. Uh, so the one in October is going to be in Spanish, actually. Uh, and it's going to be after fruit attraction. We will confirm the dates. 
But then in 2023, in the uh, probably March or April, we will do one in English for sure. Okay. So thank you, Gaia. Any other questions? Yeah. So I give you if you have any Great. other. Hello. Yeah. Somebody's trying to say something. You want to type or you prefer to speak? Good evening, sir. I am Manishankar from India. Yeah, sure. I completed I completed my graduation in agri agriculture. Yeah. Now I am planning to now I am planning to uh, continue my higher studies as a agriculture business management. Yeah. Uh, I want course duration and scope of uh, uh, ABM in Spain. Okay. So the duration is uh, 11 months. It starts mid-September and it's until the end of uh, August 2023. And then uh, you will have, so you do as part of the program, there is an internship. Right now we have students that are doing their internships in BASF, uh, in... Uh, Ingenta, Bayer by, you know, like really top uh, companies and also practical in internships. Uh, but then um, you could potentially stay uh, in Spain uh, if you get a company that's going to sponsor you. Um, you will have to do a separate visa uh, where you uh, you are allowed to stay for one year. We already have students that we haven't, they haven't even finished yet. And we already have one student from Ecuador that she already has an offer and she's doing all the process. And um, one student from India, Nikhil, who is doing the internship. Nikhil Reddy. Yeah. I already yeah. contacted him, sir. Okay. I contacted him. He is uh, same negative language. Okay. If uh, I query, oh. uh, yeah. I, he, uh, he is from Hyderabad. Oh, that's great. So that's great. You know, one piece of advice that I will give you if you decide to do the program, if you really want to consider staying in Europe, it's really important also that you learn Spanish until certain level. Sir, well, I have one. I have one doubt. Sure. Sir, uh, you are providing uh, duration uh, eleven months after completing visa validity. What yeah. we have to do after? So what I told how you. How to is, extend? How to extend our visa? After is there any year. chances to? So after comes. Yeah. Yes. First, First, you need to you need to get the sponsor to extend the visa. Once you once the, you have one year visa, then if you have a good relationship with the company and they you and they decide to extend your visa, then you can stay. Okay. So this is similar to in the United States, the OPT, you know, where you have the visa for one year. So it's very very similar in that sense. But you need to find the sponsor. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank Any you. other questions? I see another one. Yeah. But anyway, if you are in touch uh, with Nikhil, uh, and if you really want to do it for this year, it's going to be a little bit late if you don't move fast, to be honest, because of the visa and everything. All right? All right. So I think if there's no other questions, you know, uh, I'm going to leave it here. Uh, great. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, having this webinar with all of you, um, you know, uh, I will see you in the next webinar that we'll do with Isa. Thank you.